welcome to a new discussion of heat transfer. We're still talking about steady heat conduction and today we focus more on the case of plain wall. So we consider a wall, a flat wall, and the height of the wall is much larger than the thickness L. We suppose that the left side of the wall has a temperature T1 and the right side of the wall is at temperature T2. If there is no heat generation and we have a steady case, therefore the temperature does not change with time. And we can also assume that the problem is one dimensional because the temperature changes occur along the X direction much more than in the Y direction and the Z direction, which is inside the paper. Then the temperature varies linearly in the wall. So in this case, it decreases from T1 to T2 and the heat transfer occurs from the left to right. We can call this Qx, which is the component of the heat transfer vector along the x direction. So, as we said, temperature T1 is larger than the temperature T2, so Qx flows from left to right. We can, of course, also define an energy balance. So conservation of energy, the heat that flows inside the wall minus the heat that flows outside the wall must be equal to the change of the internal energy of the wall with respect to time. But we said that we only only consider now steady cases, so there is no change all over time. So the change of internal energy over time is zero. Here is zero. Therefore, the heat transfer inside the system must be equal to the heat transfer out, flowing out of the system. And therefore, the heat transfer through the wall is constant in any location X. We can use the Fourier's law of conduction Q conduction is minus Ka dt dx, and that's equally constant. But we consider cases where the thermal conductivity K is a constant. A is the area, the cross sectional area, that's also a constant. And therefore, dt dx must be a constant. If dt dx, the derivative of the temperature with respect of x, is a constant, therefore the temperature profile must be a straight line. Furthermore, since the temperature profile is a straight line, we can write dt dx as the ratio between t1 and t2, the difference between t1 minus t2 divided by L. And this expression for the heat transfer can be rearranged in this way, we can write Q conduction equal to the ratio between the difference between T1 and T2 and R wall, where R wall is defined as conduction resistance. And that's equal to the ratio between L and the product Ka. And the units of the conduction resistance are Kelvin divided by watts. So why do we call this conduction re resistance? Because there is a full analogy with electric circuits. As we know, in electric circuits, the current is equal to the ratio of the diff potential difference and an electric res resistance, which is equal to L divided by sigma EA, where sigma EA is the electrical conductivity. So we see here there is a full analogy. In the same way, we have a temperature difference in thermal circuits. 
Here we have a potential difference in electrical circuits. In the same way, we have a thermal resistance in thermal circuits. Here we have an electrical resistance. And also the formula for the electrical resistance resembles the formula for the conduction resistance that I'm showing you here again. So L divided by Ka, where K is the thermal conductivity, whereas for electric circuits, we have L divided by sigma E A, where sigma E is the electrical conductivity. So schematically, we use that representing electric circuits in this way, where we have V1 and V2 are the two uh, potentials. And here we represent a resistance, electrical resistance. So in the same way, we can represent the heat flow in this way. So we have T1 and T2 are the two temperatures and R is the conduction resistance. Q is the heat flow and it's full analogy with the electric circuit current in electric circuit. So that's for conduction. We can follow exactly the same procedure for convection. So we start with Newton's law cooling and we can write the Q convection is equal to the ratio between the difference between Ts and T infinity and a convection resistance that's defined as one divided by HAS, where AS is the surface area. H is the convection coefficient, Ts is the temperature of the surface, and T infinity is the temperature of the fluid at a large distance from the wall. So again, we can represent this part of a thermal circuit in this way, where we have Ts and T infinity, and we have a Q convection flowing through this part of the circuit. So we've talked about conduction, convection, and we can also extend the analogy to radiation. We can write, of course, Q radiation as epsilon sigma AS, and then the difference of the fourth power between the temperature of the surface and the temperature of the surrounding to the fourth powers. We can rearrange in this way, and we define the radiation resistance is one divided by H radiation times AS. So there's a full analogy with the convection problem. But here the H radiation has this form because we have expanded the difference between the fourth power. It's important to remember that in the radiation temperature must be in Kelvin, whereas in conduction problems and in convection problems Either Kelvin or Celsius can be used. We can put the parts of the circuits in, in series, just like in electric circuits, resistances can be placed in series. The same thing we can do for a thermal network. Here we have a schematic of a thin wall where we have some conduction. The left side of the wall is a temperature T1. The right side of the wall is a temperature T2. And then we have some um, flow on the left and some flow on the right. So we have convection on the left and convection on the right. And we have a t temperature T infinity one far away from the wall one. And we have T infinity two, the temperature very far away from the wall two. And then we can represent the thermal circuit in this way. So we have three resistances in series. And then we have three resistances. We have a resistance for convection on this side, convection one. We have conduction resistance and we have convection resistance on the right side. In electric circuits, we can sum the resistances that are placed in series, and we can do exactly the same thing 
for a thermal network. So Q flowing through the network, thermal network, is equal to the difference between T infinity 1 and T infinity 2 divided by total resistance. But since we are dealing with resistances that are placed in series, we can simply sum them to obtain the total resistance. So R total will be 1 divided by H1A, which is the first convection resistance, plus L divided by KA, which is the conduction resistance. And finally, we add the second convection resistance, 1 divided by H2A. Note that in general, H1 and H2 are, of course, different because we have different flows on the two sides of the wall. So if you have constant properties, so for example, constant thermal conductivity, and also we have constant convection coefficients, there's no need to find T1 and T2 to get Q. So it's sufficient to have T infinity 1 and T infinity 2 to compute Q. So once T infinity 1 and T infinity 2 are known, we can find the three resistances, we can sum them and then obtain the total Q. We can also define an overall heat transfer coefficient, Q equal UA delta T, where delta T is the jump in temperature, and U is equal to 1 divided by A R total, the total resistance. And since Q is flowing through the circuit is the same in each part of the circuit, then Q can also be found by T infinity 1 minus T1 divided by R convection. So we can find Q in each part of the circuit if we know the jump in temperature and the resistance for each part of the circuit. And we can add many layers, so you can have multiple conduction resistances. And we stress that we can use the network analogy only if we have a steady problem, one dimensional, one no, with no heat generation. In the same way we studied resistances in series, we can also have thermal networks that have resistances placed in parallel. So in this situation, here these two black parallel walls are insulated, so they are adiabatic. So there is no heat flow in this direction, heat flows just from left to right. And we have one wall here with thermal conductivity K1, another wall at thermal conductivity K2. The left side here is a T1, the right side a T2, so we can represent the two resistances in parallel. So we have a Q1 and Q2 that in generally different depending on K1 and K2. And we can sum the resistances in parallel. We can write Q equal T1 minus T2 divided by R total, where R total, 1 over R total is equal to 1 divided by R1 plus 1 divided by R2. So the formula is exactly like electric circuits. So in this way, we don't have to solve for the temperature profiles at every point in the domain. We can use the network analogy to find Q if you're given the temperatures. Instead, if you want to find the temperatures, you are given Q, you can also find um, the reverse problem. Okay, thank you very much and see you in the next lesson. Bye.